we have a gag order for Donald Trump. We have a gag order. Finally, a gag order for Donald Trump. Now we need a gaggle of gag orders. The first and what I hope are a gaggle of gag orders ordering Donald Trump to keep his mouth shut or just like Sam Bankman fried or freed, he's the cryptocurrency charlatan who wouldn't stop communicating with witnesses before his trial. So a judge uh, put him in jail before the trial. And Donald Trump has now violated, hasn't violated a gag order yet. He's about to and uh, Trump is going to end up in jail because he can't keep his mouth shut. I've never seen this kind of behavior in a court of law before where a defendant already found guilty on most counts, shows up to his trial, stink eyes the judge, threatens the judge's clerk, then holds angry press conferences in front of the courtroom door, ordering his minions to go after the New York State Attorney General, Letitia James. Well, the judge in that civil suit has had enough He issued a gag order, and I'll have more on that later. As you know, Speaker Kevin McCarthy is done. Florida Congressman Matt Gaetz kept his promise. He filed a motion to vacate the chair. McCarthy tried to table the motion on Tuesday. He failed. And then they brought it to the floor for a full vote. All it took was five Republicans to abandon Kevin McCarthy, and eight, eight Republicans voted for Kevin McCarthy to vacate the chair with no Democrats coming to his help, which some of us thought would happen. But apparently this guy has made more enemies than we know, not just in his own caucus, but with the Democrats as well. McCarthy lost the vote. And as per the rules, the clerk opened up his secret list that McCarthy provided as to who should succeed him. And our new interim speaker is Congressman Patrick McHenry, who I think has done some serious partying with Matt Gaetz, as well as Madison Cawthorn, who is no longer in the House of Representatives. Read Howie Klein, go to Down With Tyranny, and look up Madison Cawthorn and Patrick McHenry and Matt Gaetz. I think Howie has done some serious reporting on the parties that these three gentlemen have thrown. So Patrick McHenry of North Carolina is our interim speaker. And Kevin McCarthy said, that's it. I'm done. I'm not running again. And in his first act as our interim speaker, Patrick McHenry ordered Nancy Pelosi to give up her special hideaway office that Kevin McCarthy awarded her as Speaker Emerita. McCarthy is furious with Pelosi, and I think his parting shot was to make sure that Patrick McHenry took away Nancy Pelosi's special office. He feels, McCarthy feels, that she tricked him into giving his caucus one vote to vacate the chair. And he thought she would come to his rescue along with Hakeem Jeffries on Tuesday because Pelosi had promised previous speakers like Boehner and Ryan, Paul Ryan, that if they ever found themselves in the kind of trouble McCarthy found himself in, she would provide the votes necessary to save the institution. So McCarthy is really pissed off that Nancy Pelosi and Hakeem Jeffries, who replaced her, but he, you know, he, Hakeem Jeffries consults with Nancy Pelosi. McCarthy is pissed off that Hakeem Jeffries didn't bail him out, even though word is McCarthy never asked for any help. And more importantly, he wasn't interested in making a deal with the Democrats. Congress, I'm not making this up, is adjourned until next Tuesday. I don't know if they're allowed to do that, but the interim speaker said, party time. I'm going to see how Madison Cawthorn is doing. We're going to have a party. They're adjourned until next Tuesday. I don't know if that if they're allowed to adjourn. They're taking a week off. And why shouldn't they? Their work 
in Washington, D.C. is all done. We don't have a budget or a speaker. So let's take seven days off. Who says the Republicans can't govern? Who says? Huh? I'll have more on all this and, of course, Trump's second day stink-eyeing stink eyeing the judge in that civil lawsuit. But first, this is the mop-up for October 4th, 2023. I'm David Feldman. Please subscribe to my channel and like this video so I can remain in your feed. I will get to Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump in a second, but there's other stuff, believe it or not, going on. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is a 12-year-old agency that protects Americans from shady lenders. It was set up during the Obama administration, and to keep it above partisan bickering, it's funded by the Federal Reserve, not Congress. Because payday lenders and banks want to get rid of this agency, they have sued the government, claiming that this agency is illegitimate because its money comes from the Federal Reserve and not Congress, and they insist only Congress can fund a government institution. Well, a lower court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs, and by, the, by plaintiffs, we're talking payday lenders, the worst of the worst. So a lo lower court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. On Tuesday, the case went before our Supreme Court with many before the hearing started, many predicting that the conservative majority would be keen on dismantling this agency. But during hearings on Tuesday, even conservatives like Clarence Thomas, who is salivating at the prospect of destroying the administrative state by getting rid of something like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, even Clarence Thomas seems skeptical as to whether the Federal Reserve funding this agency instead of Congress, whether that is unconstitutional. Even he thinks this is nothing. Senator Elizabeth Warren, who was instrumental in the the making of this agency, and, and she was going to be the first chair, chairperson until Republicans blocked her. She said on Tuesday that payday lenders and banks want to destroy the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because it's good at what it does. Canada's parliament has elected its first black speaker. Well, they have a speaker. Can he moonlight down here in America? His name is Greg Fergus. He's a member of the Liberal Party representing Quebec. The previous speaker, now you thought <laughs> we have lousy speakers. The previous speaker, Anthony Rota, if you remember, had a step down last month when, during Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's visit, they invited a 99-year-old Ukrainian World War II veteran to stand up in the House of Parliament and take a bow. They... they <laughs> He's 99 years old. He's a Ukrainian World War II veteran. Stand up and take a bow. It turns out, yes, he's a veteran. Yes, <laughs> he fought in World War II. Yes, he's, he's Ukrainian. But he fought on the side of the Nazis. Eh, you know, potato, potato, famine. Potato, potato, famine. Many Ukrainians, by the way, sided... Uh, with Hitler during World War II, believing he would liberate their country from Joseph Stalin and the Russian occupation of Ukraine, which resulted in millions of Ukrainians starving to death from what many believe was a man-made famine in the early 30s that Stalin enacted to punish farmers who were Ukrainian farmers, the Kuyaks, who were moving away from communism and Russian control. I shouldn't have laughed. Vice President Kamala Harris administered the oath of office on Tuesday and swore LaFonza Butler in as the new senator from California to replace Senator Dianne Feinstein, who died last week. Senator Butler was appointed by California Governor Gavin Newsom, who said he wanted to pick a temporary placeholder 
who was black and a woman, but didn't want to pick any of the three major California Democrats who are running for this seat next November. Congress members, Barbara Lee, who was the only member of Congress to vote against George Bush's global war on terror, Katie Porter, and Adam Schiff are all part of the California congressional delegation, and they are running for Dianne Feinstein's seat. California Governor Newsom feared that had he picked one of them, it would have given one of them, whoever he picked, the advantage. They would get an advantage going into next year's election. So LaFonza Butler is the uh, third black woman to serve in the Senate. The third. We've only had now three. The first was Carol Mosley Brown, Democrat from Illinois, then Kamala Harris. That's all. That's it. By the way, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who's running for the seat, is a black woman who has served Oakland since 1999. In 2001, Congresswoman Barbara Lee was the only member of Congress to vote against George W. Bush's authorization for use of military force in the global war on terror, which turned out to create more terrorists than it killed. That's why I support Barbara Lee. She was the only one who had the courage right after 9-11 to say no this global war on terror is a mistake. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, serving Oakland since 1999, running for Senate, if you have some money to spare and you live in the United States, you might want to consider sending her some. Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty in a Delaware courtroom on Tuesday to three gun charges. Biden's attorneys are going to challenge a law to get Hunter off, they're going to challenge a law that forbids drug users from owning guns. This is their defense. Hunter Biden's attorneys are claiming these laws that forbid crack addicts from buying guns goes against the Second Amendment. It also goes against Hunter's father's official gun policy. It's interesting. The, the federal gun control Act passed in 1968 after Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated. Uh, our government passed the Federal Gun Control Act in 68. It banned drug addicts from being able to purchase a weapon. But in August of this year, the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that this prohibition is unconstitutional. So it's going to make its way to the Supreme Court. OK, and I'm guessing maybe Hunter Biden and his lawyers and his father are hoping that the Supreme Court will overturn the Court of Appeals since it means prison time for Biden's son. The Republican court is Africa. What do they love more, guns or locking up Hunter Biden? All right. Kevin McCarthy became the first speaker of the House in U.S. history to lose a vote to vacate the chair. After the vote, McCarthy announced that he will not try to run for speaker again. And while there's an interim speaker, his role is essentially just to run the ballots to elect a real speaker. The election for speaker begins next week. Congress is off for the next seven days, probably to turn down the temperature after an incredibly fractious civil war. I mean, they were fighting over the speaker and then they were fighting over the continuing resolution. I think they're giving just seven days of cool down, hoping that someone will emerge as the favorite to become speaker. But right now, no one appears to be the clear cut front runner. McCarthy knew if five Republicans voted against him, he would lose eight voted against him. In his valedictory, McCarthy chose instead not to blame Republicans. He blamed the Democrats, as usual, for not coming to his rescue. He said in the past, Nancy Pelosi, when she was a minority leader, had promised speakers Paul Ryan and John Boehner, Republican speakers, she promised them that she would deliver the votes necessary if their Republican caucus turned on them the way 
Kevin McCarthy's caucus turned on him. McCarthy said he was assured by Pelosi that Hakeem Jeffries, who replaced Nancy Pelosi, would help him out. But McCarthy complains. McCarthy complains the Democrats did not help him out. The office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. That's it. That's it. Kevin McCarthy, all done. All done. He will not run for speaker again. He is all done. And he uh, spoke to the press, held a little press conference, a little valedictory to start blaming people like Nancy Pelosi and the eight Republicans who turned on him. I think you've got a real institutional problem. Interesting, it was in this room, after we had won the majority, I had became speaker less, and Nancy Pelosi came to me. She was speaker at the time on the way out. And I told her I was having issues with getting enough votes. And she said, what's the problem? I said, they want this one, one person can rule you out. She was the only speaker to have changed that rule. I had the power to call the vote on her, but I never would. I lost some votes because of it. Um, and she said, just give it to him. I'll always back you up. I made the same offer to Boehner and same thing to uh, Paul, because I believe in the institution. I think today was a political decision by the Democrats. And I think, th I think the things they have done in the past hurt the institution. When they just started removing people from committee, and they just started doing the other things. And I, I, my fear is the institution fell today. The institution fell today because of the Democrats. Yes, the institution of Congress is under threat. Maybe it has something to do with McCarthy running down to Mar-a-Lago after January 6 and making nice with the guy who ordered his thugs to storm the Capitol and hang Nancy Pelosi. The guy who ordered his thugs to loot the office you're now in. Kevin McCarthy, you think that might have soured relations between you and the Democrats? You kissed the ring of the guy. You went down to Mar-a-Lago only days after he ordered his jackbooted thugs to hang Nancy Pelosi and the vice president. And then, not only this, Kevin McCarthy, after January 6th, on January 7th, early January 7th, Kevin McCarthy, after the smoke had cleared, you went back into the Capitol and voted not to certify the election for Joe Biden. And now you're worried that there's a problem with the institution? Now, because there's no bipartisanship, you're worried about the institution? You refused to appoint any Republicans to sit on the January 6th committee, and you never once blamed Donald Trump for what happened on January 6th. In fact, you voted not to certify the election for Joe Biden on January 7th, and it took months to twist your arms to get you to admit that Joe Biden was our president. You think that might be the reason Democrats have an issue of trust when it comes to you, Kevin McCarthy? You punished Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. These were two Republicans who, who decided to sit on the January 6th committee. You wouldn't allow anybody, anybody to sit on the January 6th committee and try to come to a bipartisan understanding of why January 6th happened. Instead, you punished Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. You abandoned them to serve your Trump master, and they are no longer in Congress. Kinzinger quit, Cheney lost, because of you, Kevin McCarthy. But suddenly you've discovered there's a problem with the institution. There's no bipartisanship to save your raggedy ass. Tuesday morning was a disaster for McCarthy, and it only got worse. He needed to win over his caucus. He needed to make a deal with his Republican conference, or he needed to make a deal with Hakeem Jeffries, the 
Democratic House Minority Leader. Before, the, before these votes in the morning, he told reporters... If five, if five Republicans go with Democrats, then I'm out. If five Republicans vote against me and go with Democrats, I am out. Well, so you knew you didn't have those five Republicans. So did you think of asking the Democrats for help? No. Here is Kevin McCarthy before the vote being asked if he needs House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries' help. This is before the vote. Are you expecting Democrats to back you up then? No, I, I personally am not. Do you need their help to remain in leadership? No. Um... No. Um, well, Trump don't want no help. Trump don't get no help. As I said earlier, eight, eight Republicans voted against him. All he needed to do was get eight moderate Democrats from the Problem Solvers Caucus, someone like New Jersey Democrat Josh Godheimer. He's my sister's congressperson, Josh Godheimer. Godheimer is a German word that means God help us. Josh Godheimer, Democrat from Jersey. You think Menendez. Well, anyway, uh, Gottheimer is a Democrat in name only. He he could have gotten some Dems to help. He's a problem solver. He hasn't solved any problems, but he's a problem solver. And, you know, McCarthy could have approached Gottheimer and maybe made a deal where there's some power sharing, perhaps, where some committees have co-chairs of equal stature, maybe make a deal where like the Energy Committee or the Commerce Committee have co-chairs. One's a Republican, one's a Democrat. A little power sharing, but he wouldn't ask. McCarthy wouldn't ask. Instead, he introduced a motion to table Matt Gates's motion to vacate the chair. McCarthy, early Tuesday, was hoping he could find enough votes to at least postpone the vote to vacate the chair while he tried to get the budget passed. Here are the hateful eight. There were eight uh, Republicans who voted against uh, McCarthy. These are the, the hateful eight. Would be Matt Gates, of course, the, the ringleader from Florida, Andy Biggs from Arizona, who, after January 5th, reportedly begged Donald, who after January 6th, reportedly begged Donald Trump for a pardon. Eli Crane from Arizona, I believe he last month referred to black people as colored people. I think that was Eli Crane. I may be wrong. Bob Good, he's a Republican from Virginia from Liberty University, Jerry Falwell's uh, school, and he, he wrestled for Liberty University. I wonder if he and Jim Jordan ever looked the other way. And crazy Dim, Tim Burchett, or Dim Burchett, crazy, crazy man, very crazy. And uh, Matt Rosendale from Montana, Nancy Mace, and Ken Buck. Those are the eight Republicans who voted against Kevin McCarthy. Kind of surprising. The hateful eight. And the final count was 216 voting yes, vacate the chair, and 210 saying no, don't vacate the chair. Pretty close. Uh, a lot of us were hoping that McCarthy was going to make some kind of deal with the Dems, and that would put an end to the Freedom Caucus, the far-right group of Republicans who have been a thorn in the side of every Republican speaker since 2015. It was the Freedom Caucus that eventually drove Speaker John Boehner not to just quit being Speaker, but to quit Congress altogether. We, you know, the Freedom Caucus is the worst of the worst. But McCarthy still tried to work with them. I'll show you. He reached out to the Freedom Caucus. 
he would not go bipartisan. The Freedom Caucus, as of this morning, still has power. What he ended up destroying, instead of destroying the Freedom Caucus, Kevin McCarthy probably ended up destroying the Problem Solvers Caucus. They're a group, as I said earlier, a group of moderate Republicans and right-wing blue dog Democrats pretending to be centrists. It's moderate Republicans and right-wing Democrats who are really Republicans. The problem solvers have been around for nearly 10 years, and they keep insisting that both sides can come together and work out their problems. But it turns out the problem solvers just raise money and create problems, especially for the Democratic Party. Also, there are allegations of racism and sexism and a couple of lawsuits coming down in, in their offices. Well, the Democratic members of the Problem Solvers Caucus decided to vote against Kevin McCarthy. And Republican problem solvers are pissed. Uh, there's a problem between the Republican problem solvers and the Democratic problem solvers right now. It's a problem that they can't solve. Republican members of the problem solvers are now reportedly quitting the problem solvers caucus, which means the problem solvers solved a problem. They got rid of the Republicans who are problematic. That is the first time the problem solvers ever solved a problem. They got rid of the Republicans. Now, if they can get rid of the Democrats in the problem <laughs> solvers caucus, the problem is entirely solved. It looks like it is already solved. It looks like Kevin McCarthy succeeded in breaking up the problem solvers because not a single problem solver voted for him. And the Republican problem solvers think Democratic problem solvers don't want to solve any problems. Well, so much for bipartisanship. Even the problem solvers in the Democratic caucus know that this Republican Party is fascist. At least they've been taken over by fascists. And you cannot negotiate with people who don't believe in democracy. Interesting, Lauren Boebert voted for McCarthy. She, uh, she said, I vote no for now on whether he should give up his seat. No means yes, uh, which a lot of Republicans... <laughs> A lot of Republican men have been trying to convince women of that for centuries. No meant yes during Tuesday's vote. If you voted no, it means yes, I want to keep Kevin McCarthy. And Lauren Boebert voted no, which meant yes for McCarthy, at least no for now. Boebert is a diehard Freedom Caucus member, and she, if you recall, fought McCarthy back in January. She did not want him to be Speaker. She was with Matt Gates, right? She did not want Kevin McCarthy to be Speaker. If you remember back then, she almost got into a fistfight with Marjorie Taylor Greene because Marjorie Taylor Greene was a member of the Freedom Caucus, just like Lauren Boebert, but she was giving her support to McCarthy. Marjorie Taylor Greene was eventually thrown out of the Freedom Caucus, partly because she was working with Kevin McCarthy, and mostly because, and I'm not making this up, she called Lauren Boebert, quote, a whiny little bitch on the House floor, and that was deemed inappropriate for the Freedom Caucus to call one of their members a whiny little bitch. Show up with zip ties, try to hang Mike Pence, that's fine, but... Don't call Lauren Boebert a whiny little bitch. Tim Burchett is a Republican from the very crappy state of Tennessee. He's a far-right conservative who voted on Sunday against, on Saturday, against McCarthy's continuing resolution. And he has been putting out signals that he was going to vote against Kevin McCarthy. Actually, I'm not sure how he voted on Saturday. 
I take that back. I, I played clips of him on the show Sunday, and he seemed to be against the continuing resolution, but I'm not positive he actually voted for it because he was putting out feelers on Tuesday suggesting that maybe he would vote for Kevin McCarthy to stay speaker. Well, McCarthy called him, called him Monday night and asked for his vote. And then Tim Birch had said, well, it's very hard for me. I'm praying. I'm not making this up. I saw it's on CNN. I watched the interview in between my guffaws. He said to Kevin McCarthy, I, I don't know what to do. I'm praying on it. McCarthy, according to Tim Burchett, started laughing. And <laughs> I'm praying on it. Uh, and according to Tim Burchett, uh, mocked his faith. I'm not making this up. Tim Burchett from Tennessee, Republican, right wing, told CNN that after McCarthy uh, laughed and mocked his religious beliefs, he decided that's it. I'm not voting for McCarthy because when he said, I'm praying on it, McCarthy did the right thing and giggled. I'm praying on it. You know, I, I don't like Kevin McCarthy, but laughing at Tim Burchett for saying I'm praying on it, uh, I think Kevin McCarthy deserves a Profile and Courage Award. If Caroline Kennedy is watching, give him a Profile and Courage Award for losing that vote by laughing at Tim Burchett for saying, I'm praying on it, I'm praying on it. Like, he has the direct line to Jesus and everyone else doesn't. Like, Jesus is telling him, and only him, how to vote. Donald Trump was busy in New York fighting for his brand in a New York City courtroom. He was too distracted, so we were led to believe, we, we were led to believe he was too distracted to weigh in on Kevin McCarthy's plight. Well, back in January, Trump was whipping votes for Kevin McCarthy. He was texting people like Marjorie Taylor Greene in January, telling her, vote for McCarthy. And after McCarthy won the speakership, the first person he thanked was Donald Trump for working the phones. But Trump was quiet, said nothing. But maybe not, because Matt Gates insists he's been talking with Trump every day. So what's going on? Given that Trump needs chaos, he needs the government shut down, he needs the Republican Party fighting among themselves, he needs the Republican Party fighting with the Democrats, he needs a shutdown, gridlock, chaos in order for him to emerge as the strong man who can restore order to both party and country, I'm going to assume he was quietly working against McCarthy and encouraging Matt Gates to just pull a Samson and just bring the whole house down. As I said, on this show earlier in the week, Trump wants D.C. to look dysfunctional, so Americans think he and only he can save it. This was Donald Trump on Tuesday playing dumb. Why is it that Republicans are always fighting among themselves? Why aren't they fighting the radical left Democrats who are destroying our country? He had had it with McCarthy, so he wanted McCarthy gone. Newt Gingrich, who in 1994 became the first Republican Speaker of the House in nearly 40 years, it was the Gingrich Revolution, uh, he on Tuesday morning called Matt Gates deranged. Early Tuesday morning, to prime the vote for McCarthy, he wrote a piece in the Washington Post where he called Gates childish, anti-Republican, and actively destructive to the conservative movement. 
Newt went on to write in the Post, this was Tuesday morning, trying to get votes for McCarthy. Gates's motion to remove McCarthy should be swiftly defeated, and then he, Matt Gates, should be expelled from the House Republican Conference. House Republicans have far more important things to do than entertain one member's ego. And he has previously called Matt Gates deranged. And Newt Gingrich should know. So McCarthy knew what he was up against Tuesday morning. If he lost five Republicans, he was gone. So what was his political calculus? We'll find out uh, in the next week. I suspect he thought, if I reach across the aisle and work with Democrats, I'm going to need way more than five, eight, or even 20 Democrats to vote for me and fill the void. I think that's what he figured. I think McCarthy figured that if Democrats saved his speakership in a roll call vote, there would be a snowball effect that more and more Republicans who might be inclined to vote for him would begin to abandon him. So instead of reaching out to Hakeem Jeffries, I think this is conjecture, instead of asking for help, he worked the phones and still tried to get the Freedom Caucus to vote for him. He did succeed in securing the vote from the chairman of the Freedom Caucus, Scott Perry, a Republican from Pennsylvania. Chairman of the Freedom Caucus, Matt Gates, was able to get his vote. So he was focusing Tuesday morning, Monday night, on the Freedom Caucus still. He, did, he didn't see any positive to bipartisanship. He wanted to placate the MAGA Republicans. This is House Freedom Caucus Chair Scott Perry, uh, whose uh, phone was seized by the FBI last year in order to determine what kind of role he played on January 6th. Perry denies this, but everybody else insists he was one of the Republicans who asked Donald Trump for a pardon after January 6. He also introduced Donald Trump to this guy. This would be Jeffrey Clark, a low-level Justice Department official seen here in his underwear as the government searches his home for electronic devices containing evidence linking him to Donald Trump's conspiracy to overturn the 2020 presidential election. In late November of 2020, Scott Perry ran into Donald Trump at an event, and he said, hey, you should meet this guy, Jeffrey Clark. He works in the Justice Department. He'll say whatever you want about election fraud. And Donald Trump started talking with him and was going to make Jeffrey Clark acting attorney general in the waning days of his administration. And Clark, according to January 6th report and the indictment, Jeffrey Clark was all too willing to serve as acting attorney general, and he was going to name Sidney Powell, one of his co-defendants in Georgia, he was going to name Sidney Powell as a special counsel who would prosecute Democrats for election fraud. And he answered the door in the morning in his underwear. He didn't know it was going to be the Justice Department. And they made him walk. I should play the clip again. I played it before. Can I put my pants on? They go, no, come outside. Uh, anybody home? Is your wife here? No, no. First thing in the morning, he's in his underwear. Where's the wife? Hmm, where was the wife? Let's get to the bottom of that. Don't answer your door in your underwear. Anyway, McCarthy did secure the chairman of the Freedom Caucus's vote, and he kept working the Freedom Caucus. Wasn't reaching out to Hakeem Jeffries, didn't think there was anything 
to be had there, he got Texas Congressman Chip Roy, who is one of the angriest people in Washington, D.C., because nobody knows how smart he is, or he thinks nobody knows how smart he is. I know how smart Chip Roy is. Uh, not too, not too smart. Roy, Chip Roy hates Washington, and he warned last week, Kevin McCarthy, the gloves are off. If you're continuing resolution, has any money for Ukraine, the gloves are off. I'm going to vote to vacate the chair. But Kevin McCarthy worked the phones, and he got Chip Roy to come Some around. Some of our brothers and sisters, particularly in the uh, you know, uh, MAGA camp, I think, uh, particularly enjoy the circular firing squad. You want to come at me and call me a rhino, you can kiss my ass. Look, I've spent a lifetime fighting for limited government conservatism. I have laid it all on the line. I've not seen my family for two days in the last 30 days. Right. He's pissed off. He's he announced that he was voting for Kevin McCarthy. And this was him on some podcast or television show Tuesday morning saying, I'm not a rhino. I'm an adult and I'm voting for Kevin McCarthy. And I'm pissed off. I haven't seen my family in two days. And I'm sure they're besides themselves not being able to smell Chip Roy's whiskey and deep-fried pig ear farts. This guy is the poster child for halitosis. I know this for a fact. Go ahead, listen carefully as he says the word nunnery. You go around talking your big game and you thump in your chest on Twitter? Yeah, come to my office and come have a debate, mother. You know why? Because I'm standing up for this country every single day. And Steve, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to go to a nunnery. I'm not going to go to a nunnery. <clears throat> a nunnery. Apparently, he's Ophelia, and MAGA Republicans are Hamlet telling him to get thee to a nunnery. Okay. But here's the thing. Uh... When Hamlet tells Ophelia to get thee to a nunnery, he's calling her a prostitute. Because back then, nunnery didn't mean a hangout for religious women. It meant a brothel. A really religious hangout for women. <laughs> a nunnery is what they called a brothel. It wasn't where nuns lived. Hamlet was saying, get thee to a brothel because you're for sale. And I, I, I actually think uh, Chip Roy, who's all upset that people just don't know how smart he is, I don't think he knows what a nunnery is, but he should go to one. He needs to go to a nunnery to release <clears throat> some steam or dust or mucus or blood or whatever comes out of that pathetic excuse he has for a limp noodle fawns. That's where the rage comes from, Chip. Go ahead, angry, limp noodle, Chip Roy. Very angry man. Because, God damn it, there were people who were buried over in Normandy who deserve us to stand up for what they fought for. Yes. There are people buried in Normandy who gave their lives for what Chip Roy, and only... Chip Roy is fighting for. Yes, Franklin Delano Roosevelt sent our finest young men overseas to make the ultimate sacrifice for limited government. Because when you think FDR, the first words that come to mind are limited government. That's what FDR was all about. Small government, no waste. In fact, that's why my father fought in World War II. That's why my dad enlisted Chip Roy. He said that he enlisted because if he didn't stand up to Hitler, the American government would be bloated with no accountability. How dare you wrap yourself in the graves at Normandy. How dare you, Chip Roy? Who gave this Uncle Fenster wannabe permission 
to speak for the greatest generation or any generation of soldiers. How does that make you patriotic by wrapping yourself in the graves of Normandy? I checked your bio, Chip Roy. I don't see you serving in the military. You were an investment banker, and then you went to law school, and you fell in love with guns and began playing war with your Texas buddies. But I don't think you served in the military. If, I, if you did, I owe you an apology. But I researched it today, and I don't see any war record. So who gave you the authority to speak for our soldiers? How does slashing government spending, including benefits for veterans, how does that give you the direct line to my father's friends laying in a grave right now in Normandy? Um, what's, what am I, F you, I think is what I wanted to say to you, F you. You're just another fragile white man who's angry because nobody knows how special you are. That's why you're angry. So you beat your chest and pound the table because nobody's noticing you. Go ahead, little man. And all of you fuckers out there who are out there saying what you're saying out on social media, you stick it. I'm going to go down to the floor and do my job, and I'm going to stand up for the people who fought for this country. The language on that woman. This is a United States congressman talking that way. That belies serious rage issues, problems at home with the wife, if she's at home, or it could be like Jeffrey Clark where they answer, he answers the door in his underwear early in the morning and they say, is your wife home? He goes, no, no, she's not here. Maybe that's why Chip Roy is angry. I don't know. I'm just asking questions about your limp noodle. That's all, that's all I'm asking. Is that how you talk to your kids who you haven't seen in a couple of days? Someone should do a welfare check on Chip Roy's family. Too much rage, if this is how you behave in public, what are you like behind closed doors? So in the lead up to the big vote on Tuesday, people kept asking Matt Gates, what's your plan? I mean, it's easy to tear something down, get rid of Kevin McCarthy. We all want to get rid of Kevin McCarthy, but we're stuck with them. Who are you going to replace Kevin McCarthy with? And Gates said, I would support Steve Scalise as speaker. And Steve S Scalise is beloved in the Republican caucus. He's second in command. And uh, he's currently going through chemotherapy from blood cancer. So we wish him well, really. You know, I don't agree with his politics. And I think he's responsible for a lot of Americans uh, dying from gun violence, but we wish Steve Scalise well. He's from Louisiana. When he first ran for office, Scalise described himself as KKK leader David Duke without all the baggage. That was his campaign motto. And uh, he was gunned down while practicing for a congressional baseball game. I think it was in 2017, maybe 2018. I'm going to say 2017, riddled with bullets. Luckily, he survived. And, we're, and seriously, I don't mean to trivialize that. It was touch and go. And uh, so we're glad he's OK. Um, Big supporter of the National Rifle Association. And uh, when he healed, he came back uh, to the NRA convention, I think in 2018, and he was a, a conquering hero at the NRA convention. He uh, was wounded, but he could still, he was still strong enough to pocket all those campaign contributions from Wayne LaPierre. So he was heroic. Uh, so I'm glad he's okay. I hear he's a nice guy. It's just that he's pro-gun. And when he was shot, 
riddled with bullets and almost died. Luckily, he didn't. Uh, he didn't have a come to Jesus moment and think, you know what? Maybe these automatic weapons are a bad idea. Uh, no, he didn't. Uh, but luckily, he survived, and, and I mean that. And I hope he survives blood cancer. I do. I can't help but wonder, though. Uh, he was shot in 2017, and now he's got blood cancer. And, and, you know, I can't wonder. You know, there's still lead in his body. They couldn't get it all out. And I'm worried that some of the lead in those bullets that are still in him... I'm worried that the blood leached out and into the rest of his body and caused the cancer. That's what uh, I'm worried about. I don't know. He should look into this. Uh, now I know Steve Scalise is still taking checks from the National Rifle Association, and he's an unapologetic supporter of AR-15s and guns, even though he came within inches of being uh, offed by one. And uh, I worry about him, uh, and I'm worried the lead bullets gave him blood cancer. I don't know. Maybe we can do something. Maybe we can get some bipartisan support to mandate lead-free bullets so that when people get shot, they don't end up with blood cancer the way Perhaps Steve Scalise might have contracted blood cancer. Uh, you know, I think this is a good bipartisan mission. Uh, don't worry about people getting shot. We're not going to be able to do anything about that. But maybe if we can get the lead out of the bullets after they're shot, assuming they survive and they have the kind of health care that Steve Scalise wants to deprive wants to deprive uh, most Americans. But assuming you survive, uh, let's work so you don't end up with blood cancer from the uh, fragments, the shell fragments made of lead that are still in your body. I don't know. We should look into this. Uh, you know who, who could get the lead out of bullets? I think we should look into, I think Chip Roy could uh, help us get the lead out of bullets, because uh, one of the reasons he's so angry, I hear, this is what people are saying, is because his wife, when they're in their marriage bed, uh, she keeps complaining that he seems to be led free. You know, when the lights are out and the kids are asleep, people are saying, that's what I hear. This is what I've been told. I'm just asking questions. Uh, I'm just wondering if he keeps hearing his wife complaining uh, that he's led free in the marriage bed. Uh, that's what I hear people are saying. They're asking, is this why Chip Roy is so angry? Because his wife says his bedroom virility is led free. So maybe since he knows how to get the lead out down under, he can figure out a way to get the lead out of bullets. That's what I hear people are saying. I'm just asking questions. I don't know if that's true at all. Uh, I wish them all well. I do. I, I wish them all well, and, and I hope Chip Roy heals. I hope he, uh, he can get some lead down there. Well, uh, if it's not Scalise... It could be Elise, Elise Stefanik. She's third in command. Oh, and by the way, her adorable husband, I think his name is Matthew Manda, he's a gun lobbyist. He works with the Daniels Defense to get AR-15s into the hands of crackpots. Anyway, good people, and I wish them well. I really do. I wish everybody well. Steve Scalise was asked if he was interested in becoming speaker on Tuesday. And he said, I'm not running for speaker. Kevin is, I support Kevin, and our conference does as well. And then 
the genius Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is good friends with Matt Gates. They've been partners in crime. However, she was asked, are you voting for Kevin McCarthy? Do you support, or do you support Matt Gates? And she said, there was an admission by Matt Gates, who's my friend, that there is no plan. There's no one that has stepped forward to run. There's no one that is coming out saying, I'll be speaker and rallying support within the conference. So with the clock on Tuesday ticking down, once again, Kevin McCarthy was counting the votes. And the rap against Kevin McCarthy is he's stupid and he can't count votes. And once again, before they went to the House floor, he was asked if he would consider some sort of power sharing with Hakeem Jeffries in exchange for some Democratic votes. McCarthy said, no, we won the House. The Democrats lost. You don't share power. OK, Kevin, you don't want to share. Now you get no power. That's what Chip Roy I hear people are saying that's how he raised his kids when they wouldn't share. None of you get anything now. Now you have no power. <sighs> Meanwhile, Hakeem Jeffries, the House Minority Leader, was weighing his options. There's no way he was going to get elected speaker, right? Before the vote, Hakeem Jeffries met with his Democrats in the House. And they discussed whether or not they should approach Kevin McCarthy with some kind of power sharing agreement with the Democrats. They met downstairs in the House and it was a disruptive meeting. Hakeem Jeffries uh, was surprised by how much vitriol was directed towards Kevin McCarthy. Nobody rose to support McCarthy in the Democratic caucus. The reports are he was constantly described as dishonest and as a liar. The Democrats played a video of Kevin McCarthy blaming the Democrats for the threat of a shutdown and people began to v boo him. There was talk of not voting for McCarthy, but voting present to lower McCarthy's 218 threshold. That didn't gain any traction. And Massachusetts Congressman Jim McGovern got up and said, we're not here to keep Kevin McCarthy in power. This is their problem. If they have the votes to keep him, then so be it. Kevin McCarthy was not going to get any assistance from Hakeem Jeffries or the Democrats. He wasn't asking for it, and the Democrats decided they weren't going to volunteer any help. And Hakeem Jeffries, Senate House, House Democrat minority leader, wrote a letter to his conference he said, it is now the responsibility of the GOP members to end the House Republican Civil War. Given their unwillingness to break from MAGA extremism in an authentic and comprehensive manner, House Democratic leadership will vote yes on the pending Republican motion to vacate the chair. Matt Gates was bringing the vote to the House. And in a last-ditch effort, Kevin McCarthy introduced a motion to table the motion. The idea was, uh, you know, I understand you, you, you've filed a motion to vacate the chair. Can we at least table it for a while? And uh, everybody rushed to the House floor to vote on whether or not to table the vote. Now, 10 Republicans voted against tabling. So 
These are the people we had 10 abandoning uh, Speaker McCarthy. Eight ended up voting to remove him. But uh, 10, these are the people who voted against tabling, who wanted the vote. Andy Big, Eli Crane, those two, I believe, ended up voting against McCarthy. Victoria Sparts ended up not voting against McCarthy, and she's threatening to quit Congress altogether. Bob Good voted against tabling and voted against Kevin McCarthy. Tim Burchett voted against tabling and voted against McCarthy because Burchett says McCarthy laughed when he said, I have to pray on this. Corey Mills voted against tabling, but he voted in favor of McCarthy. Now, does anybody remember, leave in the comments section, isn't this the guy who came to Congress this year and gave out hand grenades as gifts? Or did I dream that? Why do I think Corey Mills, Republican from Florida, gave hand grenades to every member of, co of Congress? And I, I'm either dreaming that or not making that up. Uh, he ended up voting for McCarthy. Matt Rosendale, I believe, ended up from Montana. I think he voted against McCarthy. Nancy Mace voted against McCarthy. And Ken Buck, let me just double check. Those are the 10 who voted to table. Let me just go back here for a second. I want to make sure I get this right. Where's my list of people who voted against McCarthy? Give me a second. Where are, the, where are the hateful eight? This is the hateful eight. These are the ones who ended up voting against McCarthy. Matt Gates, Andy Biggs, Eli Crane, Bob Good, Tim Burchett, Matt Rosendale did, Nancy Mace, and Ken Buck. Those are the people who ended up actually voting against Kevin McCarthy. All right, uh, so those are the people who voted against McCarthy and voted against tabling the measure. So now the big vote is coming up Tuesday. Do we vacate the chair? Here is Kevin McCarthy's last ditch appeal to his Republican caucus, not the Democrats. This is him making a last-ditch appeal, vote, vote for me. Don't kick me out. If you throw a speaker out that has 99% of their confidence, that kept government open, and paid the troops, I think we're in a really bad place for how we're going to run Congress. Right. Well, <clears throat> then Matt Gates uh, opened up the debate on the floor of the House. They were debating whether or not to vacate the chair, and it was basically Republicans debating Matt Gates. And this is what Matt Gates called McCarthy before the vote. He said, chaos is Speaker McCarthy. Chaos is somebody who we cannot trust with their word. Kevin McCarthy said something to all of us at one point or another that he didn't really mean and never intended to live up to. That seems to be the rap against Kevin McCarthy. They all lie, but apparently he lies uh, a lot worse, a lot worse than uh, everybody else. McCarthy's foot soldiers took on Matt Gates, and they accused Gates of sending out emails to donors on Tuesday while he was fighting Kevin McCarthy, they accused Matt Gates of using this as a fundraising device, begging for money while busy toppling McCarthy. Here is Matt Gates insisting I don't take money from super PACs or lobbyists. Here he is defending 
blasting his donors with an email request for more money. And when it comes to how those raise money, I take no lecture on asking patriotic Americans to weigh in and contribute to this fight from those who would grovel and bend knee for the lobbyists and special interests who own our leadership, who have, oh, boo all you want, who have hollowed out this town and have borrowed against the future of our future generations. I'll be happy to fund my political operation through the work of hardworking Americans, 10 and 20 and $30 at a time, and you all keep showing up at the lobbyist fundraiser and see how that goes for you. I reserve. I was watching that. I'm going, is this question time? Or is he like a member of parliament? This is fantastic. And I, I fell, briefly fell for Matt Gates just because, you know, he's stirring things up and a lot of what he says uh, is correct. It's what he stands for that's incorrect. And... It turns out, you know, he, he's a bad guy. <laughs> like, what he wants, what he's complaining about, he wants to cut spending by 30%. He said he's angry that McCarthy cut that deal to raise the debt ceiling back in June. Remember the work requirements for food stamps? In his speech on Tuesday attacking Kevin McCarthy, he complained that the work requirements for food stamps weren't deep enough. They weren't cruel enough. Here he is. This is Matt Gates warning that McCarthy, if you keep him as speaker, he will increase funding for Medicaid. I'm real glad you guys didn't put work requirements on Medicaid. It probably would have resulted in Medicaid expansion. So he's a bad guy. But... Uh, you know, he's a shit stirrer and fun to watch. Again, the planet is broiling. We need Medicare for all. Uh, Ukraine needs funding. Eviction crisis, student loan debt. But uh, it's fun to watch as it all goes down the crapper. Well, they took the big vote. And as I said, McCarthy ended up losing. The final vote was 216 to 210. I don't know. A lot of people missed the vote, and I'll find out more about that. It was only, you need 218 to pass. So some people didn't show up, and they I don't think they voted present, so I don't know why it was 216. Uh, but he, he lost by six votes, and the clerk opened up the secret list that Kevin McCarthy had by law, and the list is who would succeed him, and he wrote down North Carolina Congressman Patrick McHenry, who was named as the interim speaker. I would read Down With Tyranny, Howie Klein, go to Down With Tyranny. I believe, and maybe I'm wrong, that... Patrick McHenry has done some serious partying with uh, Matt Gates and former congressperson uh, Madison Cawthorn. That's, I think I read that, like serious parting that could maybe ethics commission, ethics committee invest. This is what people are saying. This is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm, I'm just asking questions. Go to Down With Tyranny and uh, read what uh, Howie Klein has written about Patrick McHenry and Madison Cawthorn. But I'm just asking questions, okay? And Patrick McHenry wears a bow tie. That should tell you everything you need to know about him. And he pretended to be angry. Look how hard he adjourns the session. The chair declares the House in recess subject to the call of the chair. Yeah. Wonder whose testicles he was imagining when he did that. He's pissed. Uh, so McCarthy met with his conference late Tuesday night and said, I'm done. I'm done, folks. I'm not running 
You got a week off, find somebody else. Gates at the conference was accused of trying to topple McCarthy because McCarthy wouldn't put an end to this ethics investigation into Gates's spending and partying. Nobody knows who will emerge as the front runner. Some, including me, are encouraging Jim Jordan to run for speaker because people rise to the highest level of exposing their corruption. So I'm hoping Jim Jordan gets it in his head that he should be speaker. And then that whole Ohio State wrestling scandal finally blows up in his face. So Jim, you should be speaker. You got what it takes to be speaker. What's next? A lot of people are worried about funding for Ukraine. So what's next on that? Biden wants $24 billion right now in emergency funds for Ukraine. He wants it before Thanksgiving. He wants it next week. There are some GOP hardliners from the Freedom Caucus, like Congressman Andy Harris, who are saying they would support funding Ukraine if Biden moves on some kind of negotiation for peace. Louisiana Senator John Kennedy says he's going to vote for the $24 billion funding, but he wants an inspector general. He thinks that would ease passage in the House. This is true, that there's no inspector general looking into where these weapons end up. We had an inspector general in Afghanistan. We have an inspector general in in Iraq. We've given, what, like $100 billion, I think, in weaponry to Ukraine. No inspector general checking to see who ends up getting it. Uh, 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 House Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has hinted that he would push the Senate to debate a Ukraine bill after November 17th, before Thanksgiving, but only if the 2024 budget is finalized. And he's talking of bundling some kind of bill in the Senate that would combine Ukraine with border security. Biden is very nervous about this because he wants Ukraine to get its money, and he got on the phone Tuesday, and he called world leaders, called all the leaders of NATO, the EU, and assured them that the short-term spending bill that just got passed on Saturday that was stripped of Ukraine funding was no cause for alarm. He reminded them that the Pentagon still has about $5.4 billion in weapons that they can give to Ukraine before that runs out, and they really need the $24 billion supplemental. Biden said he had a side deal with McCarthy on Ukraine, but McCarthy is now gone. He didn't know that when he was talking to the world leaders. How much... Does Ukraine actually cost us? Paul Krugman had a piece in the New York Times. He says, Ukraine aid, humanitarian and military, accounts for less than 1% of federal spending. He says it's less than 5% of America's defense budget and less than 0.3% of our gross domestic product. He says, based on gross domestic product, France, Germany, and Britain give a greater percentage of their GDP than America does. What is the situation in Ukraine as we speak? 335,000 Russian soldiers have joined the military in 2023. The Kremlin says that Russia has not abandoned their moratorium on nuclear testing. There was a rumor that Vladimir Putin was going to start testing nuclear weapons. The Kremlin denied. 
that they were going to restart those tests. But Vladimir Putin has repeatedly warned that if necessary, he would use nuclear weapons. And Britain's Ministry of Defense warned on Tuesday that Russia is using foreign agents to manipulate the West to turn people against Ukraine. So they're basically saying, if you're watching anybody who's uh, against funding Ukraine, they're getting money from Putin. That's what the British Ministry of Defense believes or is telling us. Do I have time for Trump? Should I keep going? Let me just get some water here. This is a busy day. Um, but we did it at 12.05 instead of 12.30 a.m. Should I keep going? Okay. Let me plow through Trump. Um, please like this video. I'm doing what I've been told to do. I'm asking you to like the video now instead of the end <laughs> when nobody's watching. But I don't think anybody's watching right now. But please like the video if you're still awake. Please like the video. Uh, oh, I could do subliminal messaging since I put people to sleep. This show is a soporific. I have a lot of people who fall asleep listening to me. I should put subliminal messages into their head. Um, what? Subscribe to the channel. Thank you to the moderators in the chat room. Please subscribe to my newsletter. Uh, what else? And leave comments. Did I cover everything? I did it earlier in the show now. Okay. Want to talk about Trump? It was day two for the big civil trial in New York where Donald Trump has already been found guilty of inflating his net worth to secure fraudulent bank loans. It was a really bad day for Donald Trump. The Forbes 400 came out this week, lists the 400 wealthiest people, and Trump was not on it. That's a big thing. Michael Cohen will be testifying on how Donald Trump used to order him to fudge the numbers so he makes the Forbes 400. Forbes says that Trump's fortune fell by 19% in 2022. They say he's only worth $2.6 billion. Well, we're learning from this trial that he's worth negative $2.6 billion. And this is really threatening to him. This would be the second time in three years that Donald Trump didn't make the Forbes 400. To add salt to the wounds, Jared Kushner's brother, Joshua, a Democrat, made the list. In their article explaining why Donald Trump didn't make the list, Forbes said he conned his way onto the list before. They said, this is interesting. I've never heard this before. They say his numbers can't be trusted. Somebody should look into that. They said his numbers can't be trusted. Well, day two of the trial, it started with Trump having a press conference outside the courtroom doors, insisting that Mar-a-Lago is worth $1.5 billion, maybe $2 billion. He's mad at the judge because the judge worked off what the tax appraiser in Palm Beach appraised Mar-a-Lago for, what Donald Trump agreed, signed, that Mar-a-Lago was worth. And it was something like, let's say, $18 million. And Trump is accused of borrowing against Mar-a-Lago, claiming it was worth $500 million. And now Donald Trump I mean, this is his manhood. It's, it's scary. This is, this is your, Letitia James, the state attorney general of New York, is challenging his identity. And, and he's just, he is so angry. And he's insisting, they're just lying. You know, demonstra these are demonstrable lies. Mar-a-Lago is not worth 
$1.5 billion. Uh, he also <coughs> excuse me, called Letitia James a monster and a deranged lunatic. And then the judge, who's paying attention to what Trump says, he said, you got to stop challenging my ruling last week. That's in the past. Trump keeps complaining in the courtroom. He's asked his attorneys to keep challenging the judge's ruling that the judge made last week, which said, you're guilty of fraud and we're dissolving all your shell companies and those companies are going to go into receivership, which are going to have to liquidate all your properties. And the judge said, I don't want to hear it. Stop with our other counts that we have to address. That's in the past. And so the judge said, stop talking about that. The judge also said, stop telling people that I threw out 80% of the case. Trump got it in his head that, that somehow his lawyers on Monday convinced the judge that there was a statute of limitations and 80% of his ruling will be reversed. The judge said, I don't know where you got that idea. Were you paying attention? Stop going on social media. Stop going in front of the press and saying I threw out 80% of my ruling. I didn't. And stop saying that I appraised Mar-a-Lago at $18 million. I didn't appraise Mar-a-Lago at $18 million. You did. You signed the document with the Palm Beach tax appraiser. I'm not saying it's worth $18 million. You are. And Trump is not laughing. The judge, by the way, is supposedly very... It's too bad we don't have televised hearings, televised trials in New York. Supposedly this judge is very funny, makes jokes. He's 75, came to the law very late in life. He used to drive a cab. He's supposedly very sweet. He's a Democrat, which is driving Donald Trump crazy. And he makes jokes and Trump just scowls. And then Trump, during the lunch break, took to social media and called the judge's law clerk Schumer's girlfriend and gave out her name and partly doxed her. Walking out for lunch, this is this is intimidation. This is in trial. It's a fraudulent trial. The attorney general is a fraud. And we have to expose her as that. Uh, you see what's going on. It's a rigged deal. What's and frankly, and frankly uh, you saw what was just put out about Schumer and the principal clerk. That is disgraceful. That is disgraceful. You saw what was just put out about the judge's clerk and how she's Schumer's girlfriend. You saw that. This is He's doing what Dick Cheney used to do with Judith Miller. Dick Cheney would tell Judith Miller that from the New York Times that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and she'd print it in the New York Times. And then Dick Cheney would say, you saw what's in the New York Times. They're reporting that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. He's doing the same thing. He's going on social media saying that this judge's clerk is Chuck Schumer's girlfriend. And then he comes out in front of the media and says, you saw what, what's out there. The clerks, uh, what's going on here? What the hell is that? What, what, what was that? What the hell was that? Um, okay. Let's continue. So... Trump, during lunch, deleted his truth social post where he was doxing the judge's law clerk. Uh, and it looked, if you were following this, it looked like, oh, I get it. Uh, his counsel, Trump's lawyer, told him to delete that, that it's inappropriate. But it turns out the judge, during the lunch break, uh, called 
everybody into his chambers. They emptied out the courtroom, and the 75-year-old judge, Judge Arthur Engeron, met privately with Trump, Trump's attorneys. This was after lunch, and the prosecutors, and he issued his gag order. He was pissed off. Uh, when court resumed, the judge announced the gag order. And this is important. This is really important. In front of Donald Trump and the entire courtroom, he said, quote, this morning one of our defendants, and he looked at Donald Trump, posted to his social media account a disparaging, untrue, and personally identifying post about a member of my staff. He went on, personal attacks on members of my court staff are unacceptable, inappropriate, and I will not tolerate them under any circumstances. Consider this statement, what I'm saying right now, to be a gag order forbidding all parties from posting, emailing, or speaking publicly about any of my staff. Failure to abide by this order will result in serious sanctions. That is why Donald Trump deleted the post. It wasn't on advice of counsel. The judge ordered him to delete the post, and, judge, uh, and Trump deleted it. Trump backed down. You know, with all the bluster and bravado, the judge told him to delete the post, and Mr. Big Shot deleted it. Because this is a court of law, and Trump is terrified. His lawyers are even more terrified of this judge. And I believe, and I'm hoping, this will be the first of many gag orders, a gaggle of gag orders. And one of those gag orders could end up, when violated, uh, he'll end up going to jail overnight or a couple of weeks. Uh, he's, he's pretty menacing. When you see him standing in front of the courtroom and stink-eyeing everybody, you think, this is, this is pure fascism. But he, he deleted the tweet, and nobody's storming the courtroom. His bikers, his oath keepers, his proud boys, they're locked up, or they're afraid of getting locked up. Merrick Garland, Jack Smith... Phony Willis, Letitia James, Alvin Bragg, uh, they have sent a signal to anyone who's thinking, any of Trump's supporters who are thinking of disrupting our criminal proceedings. The message is you, disru you disrupt our criminal proceedings, the, you're going to be part of our criminal proceedings. This is the trial to watch. This is, he's not going to go to jail because of it, unless he violates the gag order. But this is breaking him. If you watch those press conferences he gives, this is his manhood on the line. Plus, he needs to be out campaigning. He should not be sitting in a courtroom. Uh, but he just has to sit. They... Uh, on Tuesday, one of his old accountants testified against him, Donald Bender, and he was with the accounting firm of Mazers, which fired Trump as a client last year. The, the, uh, the general counsel, the attorney for Mazers, said, we can't work with him anymore. It's all lies. And... Most importantly, Eric Trump is there. If you look closely, you see him slinking away when Daddy is giving his press conferences. But according to the New York Times, Eric Trump is in the courtroom paying very careful attention to the testimony of Mr. Bender and biting his fingernails. Biting his fingernails. So... That's it. That's all I got. Busy day. Uh, a good day if you hate Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump 
Maybe not a good day for America. I don't know how this ends. I warned that a government shutdown is exactly what Donald Trump wants. And Mark Noller used to be with CBS. He, he tweeted out, according to the Congressional Research Service, there have been 133 continuing resolutions enacted since 1998, including 21 in 2001. The continuing resolutions spanned an average of 137 days per year, including 365 days in 2011. When Obama was president in 2011, I guess they went a year without a budget. Can that be true? Is that true? So I don't know what happens. I do know that it's in Donald Trump's best interest for there not to be a speaker, for there not to be a 2024 budget passed. Before we go, my, uh, my new girlfriend has been very, very depressed, and I just need to talk to her. Hi, honey. I, 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 bought, I know you're depressed. I bought you some flowers. Yay. And uh, I'm thinking of maybe, you know, that the medication is working. We can go out for dinner. I'll take you out for dinner. Yay. Would, would you like to see me maybe in slim jeans? And uh, I'll shave and, and look nice for you. Yay. And, and maybe uh, we can hold hands in the movie theater. Yay. You're, you're very depressed, I know. Uh, is there anything we can do together that would make you happy? Nay. Did you just say nay? Yay. You, you said nay to us having relations? You, you, you don't want to maybe... I don't know. Can I can I kiss you on the cheek? Nay. Really? You don't want me to kiss you on the cheek? Is that what you said? Don't kiss me on the cheek? Yay. Is this funny? Nay. Okay. So the thought of me uh, walking around in my boxers without my T-shirt on, what, what do you conjure when you imagine that? Yay. Okay. She's very depressed. It's not easy living with me. I'm David Feldman, <laughs> reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak, right? W was it a good show? Yay. Okay. <sighs> she needs help. Thank you for listening. Please like this. Please like it. Please subscribe to the show. Thank you to the moderators in the chat room. Thank you for all your comments. Please subscribe to my newsletter. And I will be back same time tomorrow at 12.05. If it's a busy day, like it was uh, yesterday, I'll do 12.30. But I ended up doing 12.05. I, I hit the 12.05. So... I guess I should feel good about that. How about that, honey? I, it was a busy news day, and I was going to do 12.30, but somehow I did 12.05. Yay. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll see everybody tomorrow. Are you excited about tomorrow's show, honey? Yay.